the future of music. How is music and innovation going to work together? I'm Jasper Parrott. Uh, I live in London, but in fact I spend very little time there because I'm traveling almost constantly all around the world. Um, I wasn't born in England, I was born in Sweden, but left after the age of one to go to Prague because my father was a diplomat there. So I came to England for the first time when I was four years old. And I have a mixed background in the sense that my mother to whom I was very close, uh, was Norwegian and in fact lived to the grand old age of 103. But since uh, for the last 54 years I've been working in the music and arts business um, and actually 50 years ago almost exactly started my own company with another partner when I was 25. Uh, which has uh, flourished and grown over the years and changed immensely. Um, and uh, we are now sort of beginning to look at what we're going to do for the next 50 years. Harrison Parrott was always conceived of as being a very different sort of management company from what existed when we started and also ever since. Um, it was based on a very different premise from what was the norm in the days when I was first starting to work in this field. Mostly because we believed very strongly and we were encouraged to this belief by the artists we worked with at the very beginning that um, we needed to transform the nature of the relationship, the nature of the bargain in a way between artists and management so that we focused very intensively on the wishes and the needs and the expectations of the artist from the artist's point of view, rather than as being somehow part of a sort of ship of state upon which the artists uh, got on and got off, and where actually the transition or the transaction was something that was in a way more for the benefit of the consumer than of the artist. I, was never, I would never have called myself an artist, uh, at least in the conventional sense, although I was a very enthusiastic and passionate amateur musician. I played the oboe and recorder, not very well, but with a lot of um, enthusiasm and interest. Uh, but I think I had a very strong, uh, right from my youth, I had a very strong idea about the power and value of music. And uh, I had listened to a lot of music, both live and recorded. And so I think I was um, probably quite unusually well educated about music by the time that I started. And therefore, I had one very good asset, which was that I could talk to musicians about music. Social responsibility is a rather inexact and soft description of what I think um, encompasses um, a view about, first of all, the value of the creative arts as being fundamental to a good and healthy society, and also in a way to a peaceful and harmonious society. Um, and I think that, therefore, the sort of ethical and the um, societal values encompassed in what we try to do is fundamental to almost everything. And of course, music is one of the very great communicating art forms, which is sort of one of the greatest geniuses, really, of, of, of mankind, in the sense that it, it communicates more easily between people of different backgrounds and different levels of age and talent and everything else. And so, um, as I have got older and as I've worked in this business, I have become more and more attached to the view that we have a very big responsibility. And I think at the moment we are in a sort of golden age because 
the younger generation of very brilliant performers and creative artists seem themselves to feel a much more engaged responsibility with uh, making life better, with um, aspiring to um, uh, things which are beyond the material and the sort of career-driven objectives, which were very dominant in the, I would say, in the 70s and 80s particularly. Um, and I find that very inspiring and very encouraging. And I think that the voices of artists, therefore, deserve to be much better heard. There has been a sort of um, discussion as to whether, in fact, classical music is out of touch with um, the aspirations of younger people and that whether it's in fact a sort of declining industry. And I am absolutely convinced that that's not the case. And in fact, actually what I see as I travel around the world is I've seen a quite extraordinary expansion of interest in classical music. And classical music is a term I use very broadly because it covers actually almost everything which I suppose is music uh, which uh, is, seeks to somehow elevate uh, the quality of life and the sort of intellectual standards by which one lives. Um, and I think that, that the enormous increase in public interest, especially in um, uh, far-flung parts of the world, I mean in China it's completely extraordinary, the audiences there are almost all um, in their 30s and 40s or even younger, and um, the development of um, engagement with music, often after all coming from a very different environment, it being somehow so often based in Europe, is very extraordinary and very encouraging. I think that classical musicians in general are very fortunate and in some ways they're very privileged and they are represented rather well and they actually benefit very much from quite a high level of public support and also what you might call financial support from societies which have believed that this is an important part of civilized life. And uh, partly because I think that the sheer organizational requirements of symphony orchestras and opera houses and everything else requires an enormous amount of long-term advanced planning. It has created a very effective um, landscape in which artists can thrive in developing their lives without being as pressured or as short-term as often I think afflicts particularly jazz artists who do not have the same degree of support and also I think rather rarely have the same degree of uh, opportunity to make you know good livings and earn, earn you know substantial amounts of money from what they do. So I think that in that sort of individualized area of music making I think that classical music is is privileged and ought not to take it for granted they shouldn't be com we shouldn't be too, too complacent about that fact because it could change not least because of the very very negligent short-termism of the sort of political classes who in the end determine so much which will affect actually the welfare of the music industry and also of young musicians particularly and the teaching in schools which has been almost eradicated and neglected by governments almost all over the world, leaving it all to the private sector or to charities of one kind or another. And that is a shocking neglect. Music management has extended and expanded enormously since I started. It's very competitive. Um, it has tended to be Dominated is perhaps too strong a word, but certainly there's a heavy emphasis on a relatively small number of major international companies which have the reach and the experience and the connections to be able to operate on a sort of relatively global basis. And I think that we are um, amongst the, in the vanguard of that. And anyway, we have ourselves a very strong uh, preference for the idea that we will 
work directly with all of the relative, with the, all of the respective producers all over the world directly with as few intermediaries as possible, which means that we have um, uh, built up a, a very, very international workforce. I mean, we have something like 20 uh, different mother tongues spoken amongst our staff. We have offices in London, Munich, Paris. Uh, we have people who are working out of Istanbul, Hamburg. And um, I think, and we also travel an enormous amount, so therefore we're always in touch with the the world uh, around. Now, when I started, that was absolutely not the case at all. It was very much organized on a, a sort of local management basis, and actually most managers didn't travel at all. And, um, but the, the, the demand has grown so enormously, the expertise needed in order to deal also with complicated issues to do with media and to, to do with promotion and marketing. Uh, and also to opening up new opportunities for young artists who are already often ready for performance in their teens and need to have some assurance that they will actually have the opportunities to grow and develop over maybe uh, a 50-year period or 60-year period. I mean, that's one of the great wonders about the, the one of the great benefits of the classical music world is that it is really a very, very long tail business and you can have artists who started in their teens and are still hugely active and successful when they're in their 80s. We do our best um, in terms of the sort of technology that we use or need in order to um, provide the best possible service and also to do so in a rational way. We, we, we try to be as much ahead of the game as we can be and we're constantly reviewing what we do and how we do it and trying to do it better. I don't think yet that artificial intelligence has um, a significant role to play in terms of how we do our work. I think it has an enormously um, important future in terms of what art will be and how programs and projects are actually developed and I think for some of the bigger institutions uh, it would be surprising and maybe it would even be a mistake if they are not able to benefit from the uh, exponential advantages that artificial intelligence can provide in terms of analysis and, and, and model making and all these sort of things. But so far we haven't yet found a way of doing or we haven't found the need to depend upon artificial intelligence. I am actually of the view that we will probably need to be more open to this sooner than we actually think at the moment, because I think that there are many predictive elements in algorithms which would be very helpful in a non-manipulative way in order to actually um, uh, manage data better and also to manage and to understand better where tastes are changing and where there are trends which we should pay attention to. And especially, of course, nowadays, how do you communicate uh, in the best possible way through um, social media or, or indeed through new areas of distribution? Uh, in order to do that well, um, artificial intelligence will certainly be enormously helpful. Well, we are very interested in the virtual reality uh, area, mostly as a way of creating different types of projects which uh, excite the imaginative powers, both of artists and, of course, of audiences. So um, we've had some involvement with a, a project which is a, a hologram of, uh, of Maria Callas, and uh, we are actually exploring at the moment one or two very interesting uh, projects relating to the commissioning of new music where there would be some form of um, extra um, uh, non-representational uh, contribution to the actually how the, 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 the music plays out and uh, that is something that we are extremely interested in. I am myself very interested in it and uh, a lot of the artists and some of the orchestras are beginning to be very, very imaginative on how they use these uh, new uh, techniques. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know that I, I don't know that really technological additions change the fundamental parameters of what artistic creativity is. I think that talented people learn very quickly to find new channels, new pathways in which they can communicate what they do to the public of the day, if you like. But I don't think it changes the fundamental need for the quality of the content and the quality of the actual artistic inspiration. And in a way, all of these things are tools. They are not the substance of what actually art is about. And the tools have always changed. In fact, one of the most fascinating things I've often thought a lot about is how the symphony orchestra, which is in a way one of the most amazing, incredible creations of sort of human spirit and intellect over 350 years. When you think about all of the technology that is involved in developing the instruments and how actually you balance out that sort of spiritual and emotional drive into something which requires so many incredible um, uh, integrated pieces, uh, it's a wonder. And I think that will go on. And I think the most gifted people will always find new tools which will add value to what they do. This is something that I discuss very much with my colleagues because we're a sort of three-generation business now. I'm the oldest, but the youngest are in their 20s. They have very different perspectives from mine. But I think that what we are all agreed on is that we want to transform the nature of the sort of business that we're involved with into a much more dynamic, creative and sort of pr production valued enterprise. So we want not only to empower the artists, but we also want to be a part of the process whereby the artists actually succeed in their empowerment. Um, and so um, I sometimes slightly humorously refer to our objectives in the next five, ten years as changing what we do into becoming a sort of laboratory of everything. So I want to find where we can open up and support um, creativity wherever we can and in whatever way we can, but in no way sacrificing or, or turning our back on the quite extraordinary individual power of each and every artist to be unique in, in his or her own way.